Reenchanting Humanity, a defense of the human spirit against anti-humanism, misanthropy, mysticism, and primitivism, by Murray Bookchin, published by Castle, 1995. Chapter 4 From Ecomysticism to Angelology Sociobiologists, microbiologists, Malthusians, and among the Guyans James Lovelock profess to be scientists who are dealing with facts and statistical projections. As such, their ideas and conclusions are open to critical analysis, to acceptance or rejection based on scientific criteria. If their views and conjectures are found to be incorrect, they may be modified or rejected on the basis of the evidence. Alas, such intellectual responsibility is absent from religion generally and particularly in the burgeoning credos of ecological mysticism, or ecomysticism. To attempt to critically explore contemporary ecomysticism is to enter a hall of mirrors, wherein we encounter a host of multiple reflections, double takes, confusing images, and false leads that are mercifully absent in sociobiology, Malthusian demography, Margulis's microcosmology, and Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. We may think that Wilson, Malthus, Margulis, and Lovelock are wrong in their use of data and their extrapolations, but at least their premises and conclusions can be checked. By contrast, mysticism generally celebrates its very imperviousness to rational analysis. Explicitly anti-rational, it makes its strongest appeal to the authority of belief over thought. Reason, mystics usually tell us, is cold, objective, indifferent, and, according to some of its feminist critics, even masculine. Not so with mystical outlooks, we are told, which are warm, subjective, caring, and feminine. Mystics enjoin us to listen to our intuitions and feelings, to live with a sense of mystery about the world and our interconnectedness with the whole that surrounds us. Ecomystics, in particular, tend to add a quasi-ecological dimension to mysticism by imparting a preternatural dimension to the interconnected natural world. They commonly advance a spirituality that is little more than outright spiritualism, adorned with expressions like reverence and adoration. Dressed in ecological trappings, such spiritualism has the dubious advantage of being so global, even cosmic in its outlook that nature, conceived either as a deity or as a pantheistic, all-embracing oneness, vastly overshadows human beings. One may literally get lost in this ecomystical shuffle. What at first glance seems like a generous approach to the natural world sometimes conceals a highly deprecatory view toward one of natural evolution's own species, notably humanity. Which is not to say that all ecomystics are necessarily misanthropes, unsympathetic to the human condition. In the best of cases, many of them are essentially conservationists, imbued with a sensitive regard for the well-being of animal and plant life, which they see as a continuation of their concern for social justice. Hardly anyone with a sense of responsibility to the natural world can fault them for attempting to deepen public concern for the loss of wildlife, forests, and unsettled land. This laudable impulse is eminently desirable in a time of growing ecological devastation. But still others advance far more than a conservationist viewpoint. They propound a quasi-religious philosophy that is explicitly anti-humanistic. Even as their outright spiritualistic beliefs immunize their intuitive views to rational inquiry their explicitly anti-civilizatory and anti-technological views yield a far-reaching deprecation of humanity and its interventions in a presumably pristine natural world. This description of ecomysticism is by no means extreme or tendentious. The attributes I have touched upon appear very clearly in the body of views called deep ecology, as named by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness in a 1972 lecture. Note. Ness's lecture was published as The Shallow and the Deep, Long Range Ecology Movement, Inquiry Vol. 16, Spring 1973, pages 95 to 100. End note. Ness's brief, often obscurely worded lecture advances seven theses that are actually more proclamatory than expository. He makes very little attempt to argue out his conclusions but instead essentially announces them under the catchy name of the The Deep Ecology Movement, in contrast to the Shallow Ecology Movement, which he views with unmistakable disdain. 
where the shallow ecology movement is simply occupied with a fight against pollution and resource depletion and seeks to preserve the health and affluence of people in the developed countries, the deep ecology movement, according to Ness, sees all living things, including humans, as knots in the biospherical net or field of intrinsic relations. Note. Ebedem, P95. End note. His use of the word movement in 1972 was at best metaphorical, there were no deep ecology and shallow ecology movements in the English-speaking world when the article was written. Ness's names refer to two of several environmental tendencies that were beginning to attract public attention. Indeed, deep ecology was virtually unknown until the late 1970s and early 1980s. Nor was Ness's distinction between the anti-pollution and anti-resource depletion activities of environmentalists and something deeper in original theory. A similar distinction had been made in a multitude of books and articles throughout the 1960s, not only in my own writings but in those of Barry Commoner, Leo Marx, and René Dubos. Nor was it fair on Ness's part to confuse Western economic affluence with the very reasonable concerns of people in developed countries for their health. Note. For my own part, I had made a distinction between environmentalism, which I respectfully regarded as single issue but often socially unsophisticated and instrumentally oriented struggle against pollution, nuclear power plants, road building, and the like, and ecology which located environmental dislocations in the very constitution of society as we know it today. I presented this distinction in a lecture at the University of Buffalo in 1971, which was published first in a small periodical called Anarchos in 1972 under the title Spontaneity and Organization and republished in my collection toward an ecological society, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1980, pages 272. In 1971, to the best of my knowledge, neither Arnice nor the phrase deep ecology was known to most environmentally oriented people. My own lecture and subsequent related articles like my 1973 toured an ecological society, in the anthology of the same name, called for a radically different sensibility toward the natural world and the need for a total remaking of society in which I rooted the environmental crisis. End note. By the late 1960s, a very sizable literature, and mounting evidence, had appeared in the United States and Europe on the dangers that food additives, heavy metals, pesticides, nuclear wastes, and exotic chemicals presented to public well-being. In fact, by the early 1970s, American environmentalists, or what Nice called shallow ecologists, were very deeply concerned with the environmental impact of the affluent society. They made symbolic protests like the public burial of automobiles, naive gestures perhaps, but expressly demonstrative actions against consumerist values. What they lacked was not an explicit opposition to consumerism or affluence but a clear understanding of the profound social sources of pollution and the destruction of wildlife habitats. Nor did 1970s environmentalists have to be told about the need for biological diversity and symbiosis, themes that form one of Ness's theses in his inquiry article. Such ideas had been percolating within anarchic new left ecological tendencies since the mid-1960s, and a literature was emerging that stressed the need for diversity as a basic requirement for ecological well-being. Ness's thesis on local autonomy decentralization, and soft technologies was also old hat by 1972, I had personally advanced it in a comprehensive inventory of alternative energy sources like solar, wind, and geothermal power as early as 1962. Note. Our synthetic environment, under the pseudonym Lewis Herber, New York, Alfred A. Knopf, 1962, and towards a liberatory technology, republished in post-scarcity anarchism, San Francisco, Ramparts Press, 1971. End note. Finally it is worth adding that apart from his general references to decentralization, diversity, and symbiosis, little in Ness's remedies for the environmental crisis distinguished his ideas from the reformist activities of shallow ecologists. Indeed, deep ecology was quite tame in its vision of a new social dispensation. But Ness and his acolytes during the 1970s, 
confined to their fastnesses in the academy were basically isolated from the new ecological trends, technological, communitarian, and political that were emerging in the United States. Their writings reveal little lived contact with the international environmental movement that was unfolding. If deep ecology was a movement, it was overwhelmingly a cerebral one that had little interaction with groups actively trying to expand public consciousness of environmental hazards and indeed of the need to change society's way of interacting with the natural world. From a theoretical standpoint, in what way did Nice distinguish deep ecology from shallow and other ecologies? Ness's formulation that constituted deep ecology's most distinctive contribution to environmentalism was biospherical egalitarianism. What Nies nice meant by this expression was a deep-seated respect, or even veneration, for ways and forms of life. Note. Ness, shallow and deep, p95, emphasis added. End note. To the ecological field worker, Nies nice added, the equal right to live and blossom is an intuitively clear and obvious value axiom. Note. Ebedum, p96, emphasis added on the word intuitively. End note. In the closing sentences of his two-paragraph thesis, Nice went on to address the extent to which such respect and reverence are important for the quality of human life, indeed, the deep pleasure and satisfaction we receive from close partnership with other forms of life, as well as the alienation we feel from each other in the absence of such a partnership. What is striking about these passages is precisely the intuitive basis on which they rest and the extent to which Ness's biospherical egalitarianism, or what was later called biocentrism by his acolytes, is oriented toward our own human, perhaps even anthropocentric pleasure and satisfaction in living in close partnership with other forms of life. In this respect, Ness's rather anthropocentric concern for human pleasure and satisfaction is exceptional among the many people he and his followers were to win over to deep ecology and their wildlife and conservationist concerns. In time, Ness elaborated his position of biospherical egalitarianism into a self-proclaimed biocentric ethic that professed to intuitively endow every life form with an unquestionable intrinsic worth or intrinsic value. In a biospherically egalitarian world, According to this ethic, human beings are intrinsically of no greater, or lesser, value, than any life form, be it a wolf, bear, eagle, or fruit fly. Like all other animals, Nice allowed in his later writings, human beings have a right to kill other life forms to meet their vital needs, which raises the very arguable question of what constitutes human vital needs. To this question Nice and his acolytes were essentially to respond by asking us to reduce our needs and live simply, which again raises the question of what one means by simply. In Ness's inquiry paper, all of these arguable issues were resolved with a catchy slogan, live and let live, apparently with the exception of predation to acquire food and meet other vaguely stated needs. In fact, many deep ecology acolytes used the slogan to justify, in theory, at least, a minimalist, indeed primitivist vision of human interaction with the natural world. Which is not to say that all deep ecology theorists necessarily gave up their computers, sophisticated binoculars, and other high-tech accoutrements of the affluent society in favor of a primitive lifestyle. But interference with the ways of nature was viewed askance. Indeed, the worldview of primitive or primal peoples, who, it was assumed, lived in a joyously simple partnership with and love for the virginal world around them, became a model for contemporary ecological visions of behavior and reality. Ness, for his part, enjoined deep ecologists to fight against economic and cultural, as much as military invasion and domination, and to oppose the annihilation of seals and whales as much as to that of human tribes or cultures. Note. Ebedum, P96. End note. Such injunctions, too, were becoming the conventional wisdom of environmental groups in the 1970s throughout much of the Western world, not only in the United States but in Britain and Germany where Ness's inquiry paper was virtually unknown. Indeed, so embedded were anti-militarist and conservationist views in the conventional wisdom of environmentalists by the 1960s and 1970s that, when wedded to the new left activism of those decades, 
they acquired a radical political and social form. There is precious little in Ness's inquiry paper that was not old hat at the time he wrote it. Even Ness's biocentrism, seemingly the most original feature of the paper, had become the stock in trade of conservationists influenced by the writings of John Muir and his conscious or unconscious devotees. Yet despite its brevity, Ness's paper unavoidably, and perhaps deliberately, raised but left unanswered a number of problems that still haunt the deep ecology movement to this very day. Why did such a patently simplistic and singularly unoriginal body of views as deep ecology take root in the first place, initially in the United States and later in Europe? To a great extent, it was the very simplicity, indeed, the simple-minded message, of Ness's ecological philosophy that made it attractive. Deep ecology makes no great intellectual demands upon its followers. Its intuitions and a priori concepts, usually presented as simple homilies and metaphors, make it accessible to anyone who vaguely loves nature. More a mood than a body of ideas, deep ecology derives its message from the same intuitive materials that have long been exploited by assorted gurus, shamans, priests, fakirs, and dubious psychotherapists. Deep ecology in effect, makes its appeal to the heart rather than to the head, and little intellectual effort is required to absorb its maudlin message of how to live the simple life and behave ecologically. But what accounts for its rise to popularity rather than the similar, equally intuitive ecological tendencies that surfaced almost simultaneously with it? One of Ness's more state academic admirers, Warwick Fox, explains its influence as the result of a remarkably successful public relations job. As Fox observes, quote, the eco-philosophy community's acceptance of the shallow-slash-deep ecology distinction is due far more to the powerful advocacy that the distinction received from a couple of writers from 1979 to 80 on, rather than to any kind of collective decision on the part of the eco-philosophy community. In other words, as with so many ideas, the shallow-slash-deep ecology distinction was effectively thrust upon its relevant intellectual community rather than elected to office. End quote. Note. Warwick Fox, Tour de Transpersonal Ecology, Boston, Shambhala Publications, 1990, p. 58, emphasis added. End note. The couple of writers to whom Fox alludes are two Californian academics, George Sessions and Bill Deval, who zealously promoted deep ecology among a newly emerging environmental professoriate at academic conferences and particularly through Sessions' newsletter Ecophilosophy in the mid-1970s. In Fox's view, if a given typology, Ness's, in this case, finds a couple of persuasive, committed, industrious, and eloquent supporters where the other typologies did not, you have the beginnings of an identifiable intellectual movement slash grouping slash school. Note. Ebedum, p. 59. End note. Indeed, so important were Deval and Sessions to the promotion of deep ecology that Fox, in his highly sympathetic account of the movement, observes that the two men, quote, are generally, and rightly, acknowledged by ecophilosophers first, as being almost wholly responsible for having introduced Ness's distinction between deep and shallow ecology to the ecophilosophical community, in about 1979-80, second, as being very largely responsible along with Ness, for having influenced the ecophilosophical community in general to the point where reference to Ness's typology became accepted as standard within the space of a few years, by around 1983-84, and third, as being very largely responsible, again, along with Nice for having influenced a number of individual ecophilosophers to the point where these individuals now identify themselves and slash or are identified by other ecophilosophers as deep ecologists, or, at least, as close relatives. End quote. Note. Ebedum, P60. Fox's account of deep ecology and its development is among the most serious to appear in the movement, regardless of whether he himself is a member in good standing. End note. In fact, Deval's and Sessions' promotion of deep ecology occurred overwhelmingly within the framework of a collegiate professorial world during the late 1970s, in backwoods campuses like Sierra, Pitzer, and Humboldt colleges. 
Sessions' general appeal may have been more the result of his interest in Spinoza and Whitehead than in Ness, whose work he does not seem to have known until 1973. Ness, in turn, apparently attracted Sessions because of their shared interest in Spinoza. Deval appears to have followed Sessions more as a wilderness conservationist than as an ecological theorist. In any case in journals, bulletins, conferences, and seminars, academics generally deal with other academics. Like any professional coterie, they cite one another's works and form clubby enclaves, quite apart from the movements, social or environmental, that swirl around their campus world. Not surprisingly deep ecology in the late 1970s and early 1980s was mainly a campus-oriented phenomenon. Its following seems to have been composed mainly of teachers and the students they influenced, many of them were locked into their own disciplines with only glancing contact with the actual environmental movements around them. But of the greatest importance to deep ecology's rise, far greater than Sessions and Deval's efforts in promoting it, was the ideological climate that followed the decline of the new left, a climate that favored intuitive and mystical notions. These notions had already existed in the 1960s counterculture, which had mixed sporadic political activism with an abiding fascination for Asian mysticism. With the demise of the new left, the counterculture's mysticism literally exploded in California in the New Age. As the tidal wave of mysticism, with all its narcissistic byproducts, rolled across the Sun Belt, it created a cultural region that can be justifiably called the mystical zone of the United States. Judging from the writings of Deval and Sessions, their academic cloister did not render them immune to the mystical viruses that were exploding in the collegiate and countercultural worlds of their region. Drenched in Taoist, Buddhist, pagan, magical, and generically mystical notions, the California air has proverbially produced eclectic versions of the occult, indeed, of the cultic, to an extent that gives it few equals elsewhere in the Western world. The new left of the radical 1960s had more or less steadied the various spiritualisms that flourished in that culture area by freighting them with political ballast. Mere intuition alone did not suffice to fight institutionalized racism in the South or to protest the repression of free speech in northern universities, let alone to maintain a viable political organization on campus. At the national level, Overheated notions of imminent social revolution created a degree of political zealotry that overshadowed the more or less zany religious cults that flourished in California's bohemias. Once the secular constraints that the new left imposed on California's counterculture were removed, however, the mindless spiritualism of the mystical zone reclaimed its traditional territory. Worse still, it rebounded militantly against the high politicization of the decade from which it had been expelled, partly as an anodyne for the anime, the meaninglessness, and deadening mediocrity that marked American life in the 1970s and 1980s, partly too as a highly profitable source of income for the gurus who supplanted new left organizations. Ideas, and the need to think them out or seriously deal with them, which the new left had at least professed to demand in its debates and factional conflicts, were increasingly replaced by the fantasy world that the mystical zone had nourished over previous generations. Vaporous feelings displaced the mind-bending challenges of rationality while the delights of mythopoesis and mystery displaced the cold demands of secularity and intellectual clarity. Quite bluntly the late 1970s were an ideal time for deep ecology to take root in California, indeed in the mystical zone generally. It was an ideal slogan for reprocessing, in typical Sunbelt fashion, into a Velton's chunk superficial enough for anyone to adopt and spiritually uplifting enough to offer a restful soporific for all troubled souls. Indeed, deep ecology was an excellent analgesic for the intellectual headaches of a culture that felt more at home with Disneyland and Hollywood than with political radicalism. Nor was the mystical zone, which pioneered deep ecology alone in seeking relief from the demanding political and intellectual tribulations of Western civilization. The anti-humanism, mysticism, and misanthropy that are now sediment into present-day culture have long roots in the social decay of our time. Deep ecology is a symptom of that decay even more than it is one of its causes. What eventually catapulted deep ecology from the campus into the broader public realm was a conservationist direct action movement, Earth First, 
that gave Ness's notion of biospherical egalitarianism or biocentrism headline quality. Inspired by Edward Abbey, whose books such as Desert Solitaire had gained a wide audience of nature-oriented readers, a number of fairly young wilderness enthusiasts in the American Southwest embarked on a direct-action monkey-wrenching campaign to preserve and, if possible enlarge as much of primordial America as they could. The concept of monkey-wrenching came from Abbey's popular novel, The Monkey Wrench Gang, 1975, in which a conservationist band of saboteurs wander through American deserts, demolishing billboards and earth-moving equipment, and ultimately plan an ill-starred attempt to blow up the Glen Canyon Dam. Earth First was ostensibly founded by five men in April 1980, David Foreman, Mike Rosell, Howie Wolk, Bart Kohler, and Ron Kazar, of whom four came from conservationist organizations and one, Rosell, from a new left anti-war activist background. Judging from Foreman's confessions of an eco-warrior, the name Earth First was chosen to express the primacy of the planet above such humanistic notions as people first. Note. Dave Foreman, Confessions of an Eco-Warrior, New York, Crown Trade Paperbacks, 1991, p. 26. End note. Foreman, at one time a Barry Goldwater admirer and political conservative, is credited with inventing its name and Roselle is credited with designing its logo, a clenched fist in a circle. If Foreman's title denoted his misanthropic attitude toward the human species, Roselle's logo reflected the influence of the leftist tradition from which he ostensibly derived some of his social views, he later broke with Foreman presumably because of his misanthropy. Organizationally Earth First never became more than a very loosely formed tendency within the environmental movement. In fact, most of its activities in the United States were essentially theatrical. More rhetorical than real, with its slogans favoring monkey wrenching and eco touch the group made headlines because of its threats to sabotage lumbering operations. Its colorful guerrilla theater antics at lumbering sites, in which supporters dressed in animal costumes and carried large, decorative banners, were mediagenic photo opportunities that made the front pages of newspapers. Earth First also became an excellent and much-needed target for industry's cries against environmental extremists, which tended to give a terrorist patina to the entire environmental movement. In fact, the Earth First tactics of sitting before bulldozers, occupying tree branches, and blockading small tracts of forest land were largely symbolic, the movement was generally more of a media creation than a serious challenge to polluters, lumbermen, and developers. To be sure, Earth First, at least while Foreman led it, added a sharper edge to the demands of conventional environmental organizations and even embarrassed them, but its achievements, in fact, were modest, and after much infighting, the extent to which Earth First can still be said to be a stable or definable movement is arguable. In its heroic days, however, Earth First members and supporters shared certain views that were expressly anti-humanistic. Although its members' supporters, the distinction is difficult to make, had diverse environmental agendas, its most articulate and best-known leaders were avowed Malthusians and even crude misanthropes. Their new left tactics and logo notwithstanding, they advanced no serious criticism of the social status quo. As a number of their most articulate spokesmen were to emphasize, Earth first regarded social issues as humanistic, they concerned the much-despised human species, not the furry or feathery non-human ones. By the early 1980s, whatever the clenched fist logo that appeared on its periodical, Earth First, may have originally meant, the periodical's editors and principal writers had adopted deep ecology as their theoretical framework, and the periodical opened its pages to deep ecology's leading proponents in the United States, Bill Deval and George Sessions. In 1980 and 1981, in fact, it would have been hard to decide whether deep ecology was a movement or an academic ripple. Inasmuch as Ness's inquiry article was unknown beyond a few campuses even in California, deep ecology's influence seemed to depend upon the number of people who read Sessions' newsletter, Ecophilosophy, or were privy to hearing Deval's papers at academic conferences. Oddly enough, even Ness, who did not meet Sessions until 1978, used the phrase deep ecology rather sparingly. 
it was Deval who, according to Warwick Fox, elaborated the basic ideas of deep ecology at greater length than Nice under the name of deep ecology and surveyed and classified much of the existing literature in terms of its points of contact with these ideas. Note. Fox, Transpersonal, P66. End note. In a second series of newsletters, sessions, even more than Nice, seems to have established the typology that currently passes under the name of deep ecology. Despite his penchant for a Spinozistic pantheism and Asian quietism, Nice retains strong roots in his background as a logical positivist, which is to say that he often takes recourse to precise mathematical and logical definitions, so akin to the analytical formalism that constituted his earlier philosophical training. By contrast, Sessions is so patently mystical that his writings contrast markedly with those of Nice. As Fox observes, quote, under deep ecology sessions classified Christian Franciscans, as opposed to Benedictine resource stewardship, the philosophy of Spinoza, the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger, the pantheistic eco-philosophy of Robinson Jeffers, Aldo Leopold's ecosystem-oriented ethics, John Rodman's ecological resistance slash ecological sensibility, Eastern process philosophy, Taoism and Buddhism, Western process philosophy, Heraclitus, Whitehead, and four sessions, Spinoza as well, the ecological wisdom of various tribal cultures. Note. Ibedim, pages 66 to 7. End note. In short, this typology is an eclectic hodgepodge. Spinoza allows for no comparison with Heidegger, and that Taoism and Buddhism can be regarded as process philosophies is, to put it mildly arguable. But what most of, although by no means all, these philosophies have in common is a strong mystical undertow more characteristic of Californian notions of wisdom, than Norwegian notions of analytical sobriety. Moreover, apart from Spinoza, who by no stretch of the imagination can be regarded as biocentric, indeed, quite the contrary is true, and possibly one or two others, Many of the proto-deep ecology thinkers Fox lists are essentially anti-rationalists. Thus, precisely what constituted a wide-ranging or coherent theory of deep ecology was anything but clear, a problem that beleaguers it to this day. The deep ecology literature was confined for years mainly to academic papers and sessions newsletters. By the early 1980s, in fact, no single volume had yet appeared in English that could be called a definitive deep ecology book. To the extent that deep ecology has since become an established eco-philosophy, it was primarily among some 200 or so professors and slash or their students whom Sessions and Deval could reach with their newsletter and conference papers. Despite growing support today many academic environmentalists viewed deep ecology with considerable skepticism or rejected it outright. For the rest of the mystical zone, deep ecology was more of a rumor that denoted deep thinking than a movement or coherent outlook. Not surprisingly the phrase deep ecology first appeared as the title of a book which was in an anthology edited by Michael Tobias in 1984. Note. Michael Tobias, ed. Deep Ecology, San Diego, Avant Books, 1985. At the time, I protested the use of this title for an anthology containing my article toward a philosophy of nature, only to be reassured by Tobias that the anthology contained many people who were not deep ecologists, including Garrett Hardin. End note. Tobias seems to have used it as a catch-all phrase to denote any insight that seemed more searching than the popular environmentalist literature of the day. Not until 1985 did Deval and Sessions write and edit a collage entitled Deep Ecology, Living as if Nature Mattered, making a definitive statement of deep ecology available to the English reading public. Note. Bill Deval and George Sessions, Deep Ecology, Living as if Nature Mattered, Leighton, Utah, Gibbs M. Smith, 1985. End note. The book was indeed definitive, for it reflected the eclectic typology of deep ecology that Sessions had formulated more than any book on the subject since. By their own admission, 
the central theses of Deval's and Session's deep ecology are two ultimate norms or intuitions which are not themselves derivable from other norms or intuitions self-realization and biocentric equality. Note. Deval and Sessions, Deep Ecology P66, Emphases in the Original. End note. Like Nice before them, Deval and Sessions use the terminology of intuitions, not reasoned reflection. Intuitions constitute our sense or feelings about something. As a momentary personal apprehension, they are notoriously unreliable, indeed, they constitute precarious grounds upon which to base any outlook, much less the veritable Veltons Chung that deep ecology professes to offer. It is my intuition, for example that Deval's and Session's intuitions are outrageously wrong, which says nothing whatever about the validity, soundness, or insightfulness of either my or their conflicting intuitions. Lacking divine guidance, I fail to see how this conflict can be resolved except by the intuitions of our readers. It should come as no surprise then, that Deval and Sessions tell us that their two ultimate norms cannot be validated, of course by the methodology of modern science based on its usual, mechanistic assumptions and its very narrow definition of data. Note. Ebedum, P66. End note. This loaded and highly pejorative statement encloses deep ecology's norms in a closet beyond the reach of critical analysis, immunizing deep ecology to the methodology of science and the challenge of reasoned argument. By casting aside reason, deep ecologists may dismiss, presumably intuitively, any method or data that are critical of their views. In the process, Deep ecology appeals to an increasingly popular but erroneous image of scientific method as mechanistic and confines its terrain of inquiry to a very narrow definition of data. This antiscientism may go over well in the scented ashrams of the mystical zone, but the methodology of science merely requires experiential proof that various ideas are real, not divinations spun out by mystical gurus with or without PhDs. In other words, the methodology of science constitutes a minimal objective criterion by which we may judge ideas on the basis of reality and not on the basis of the self-proclaimed insights of spooks. This is no trivial problem in a world increasingly beset by supernatural, manipulative, and, dangerously authoritarian intuitions that range from experiences with angels to fascistic fears of racial pollution. Nor is the methodology of science always mechanistic. Apart from what is commonly called scientific method, a phrase that I believe requires restatement, the specific techniques associated with scientific analysis often vary from science to science. Hence deep ecology plays upon a popular prejudice that the methodology of science is confined to a very narrow definition of data. Cosmology today is such a sweeping, extravagantly creative, and even dialectical field of study that to call its methodology narrow is, to put it gently, evidence of gross ignorance. Its ever-changing and expanding vision of the origins, nature, and future of the universe defies some of the most imaginative plots dreamed of in science fiction. Chemistry in turn, with its dissipative structures, is the scientific discipline par excellence for deriving systems theories, in which some of the most mystical of the mystical zones theorists dabble. Biology for its part, abounds with a wealth of speculations and experiments that make the insights of deep ecology's founders seem singularly unimaginative. Paleoanthropology ethology and geology all have thrown more light on the marvels of the natural and human worlds in single papers than can be found in all the tomes on spiritualism and deep ecology in New Age bookstores. What Deval and Sessions seem to be telling us, in effect, is that they have an ideology called deep ecology that rests on their intuitions, and that to challenge them is to be captive to the narrow and mechanistic method they impute to the sciences. Worse still, their intuitions cannot be judged by rational criteria, which presumably originate in a narrow and mechanistic methodology. And herein lies the rub, we cannot, by Deval's and Sessions' criteria, enter into a rational or scientific exploration of their intuitions because to do so would challenge the authority of their personal faith. Thus, for Deval and Sessions to claim that their intuited norms are arrived at by the deep questioning process and reveal the importance of moving to the philosophical and religious level of wisdom is rhetorical. Note. Ebedum, 
P66, emphasis added. End note. No deep questioning process can rest exclusively on intuition, least of all that of Arnness, to which they are referring here. If Deval's and Session's deep questioning cannot be supported by experiential reality other than what they regard as valid experience, it simply cannot be challenged. One cannot attain a philosophical and religious wisdom without acknowledging the premises of objective knowledge, which include science, and the need for logical consistency, both of which stand at odds with the privileged claims of intuition. A questioning process that is insulated from rationality and experience can hardly be said to involve very much questioning at all. Nor is one intuition true and its contrary false if both rest merely on a personal belief. This is no trivial matter. It took thousands of years for humanity to begin to shake off the accumulated intuitions of shamans, priests, chiefs, monarchs, warriors, patriarchs, ruling classes, dictators, and the like, all of whom claimed immense privileges for themselves and inflicted terrible horrors on their inferiors on the basis of their intuited wisdom. Once we remove the imperatives of rational inquiry that might challenge their behavior and the scientific criteria of truth that might challenge their mystical claims to insight, social elites are free to use all their wiles to subjugate, exploit, and kill enormous numbers of people on the basis of unsupported belief systems, irrational conventions, and purely subjective views of society and the world. A multitude of intuitions and irrational belief systems are returning to the foreground in the closing years of this century. From mystical divinations to ethnic hatreds, these belief systems have grave implications for the future of modern society and the way people view reality. That deep ecology has contributed to this regressive trend with hortatory claims that are strictly subjective, even personalistic, and often reactionary cannot be ignored, and must be seriously probed. Of the two ultimate norms Deval and Sessions into it, the first, self-realization is the more wayward. In the counterculture of recent years, few terms have been tossed around more frequently than this eminently Western philosophical, religious, and psychological expression. If self-realization means anything, it certainly implies the free development of a person's distinctive and individual potentialities. This Euro-American image of selfhood and individuation has been centuries in the making. Deval and Sessions dismissively caricature it as the modern Western self which is defined as an isolated ego striving primarily for hedonistic gratification or for a narrow sense of individual salvation in this life or the next. Note. Ebedum, P67. End note. Western culture has nurtured a sense of individuality that is vastly more than isolated, hedonistic, and materially egoistic. Indeed, self-realization as a fulfillment of individual intellectual and spiritual potentialities was a major goal, if not the major goal, of thinkers such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle Aquinas, the Renaissance thinkers, Luther, the French Enlighteners, Hegel, Marx, and Freud, among many others, whose names are conspicuously absent from Deval's and Session's book. The reason these names do not appear in their book is obvious. By self-realization, Deval and Sessions leave little doubt that they mean a certain type of religious notion of the self that can more properly be called self-effacement. We have to shed, as they put it, the modern Western self and return to the traditional Asian notion of the individual, who disappears in a self in self where self stands for organic wholeness. More precisely we have to return to a self for whom the phrase sick. One includes not only me, an individual human, Deval, and Sessions emphasize, but all humans, whales, grizzly bears, whole rainforest ecosystems, mountains, and rivers, the tiniest microbes in the soil, and so on. Note. Ebedum, P67, emphasis added. End note. Subsumed in the unending natural cycles of ahistorical cosmologies, this self, or more precisely the lack thereof, is divested of control over its destiny. Historically such a self was long subjugated to despotic monarchs and lords, all of whom have spoken in the name of a natural order, natural forces, and a divine or cosmic power, ideologies that drained peasants, craftspeople, and slaves of the will to transform their destinies, not to speak of the spirit of revolt. 
This self-abnegating notion of individuality resonates with precisely the animal deities and spirits that humanity had to eventually exorcise in order to render social life secular and divest itself of imperial rulers who claim naturally endowed powers for themselves. A self in self that realizes itself as part of an unthinking community of whole rainforest ecosystems, mountains, and rivers, the tiniest microbes in the soil, and so on has not merged its identity with a larger cosmic whole, it has lost its identity its distinctively human qualities as well as individual contours. Moreover, imputing a notion of the self to non-human beings and even inorganic entities presupposes a very anthropomorphic treatment of these phenomena, which cannot constitute a self in any meaningful sense of the term. The and so on invites us, once we have imparted selfhood to mountains and rivers, to think of the barren moon, the stars, interstellar space, and galaxies, in terms of a degree of self in self, perhaps in harmony and interconnected with the entire cosmos. This rhetorical recycling of Taoism and Buddhism, and their Western filiations, into a vulgar Californian spiritualism leads us, almost unerringly, to the other ultimate norm on which deep ecology rests, biocentric equality. Simply put, quote, the intuition of biocentric equality is that all things in the biosphere have an equal right to live and blossom and to reach their own individual form of unfolding and self-realization within the larger self-realization. This basic intuition is that all organisms and entities in the ecosphere as parts of the interrelated whole are equal in intrinsic worth. End quote. Note. Ebedum, P67, emphases added. End note. This stunning doctrine literally defines deep ecology. Deep it is in every sense, not only in the intuitions that the authors and their acolytes hold, but in the many presuppositions they make. If the self must merge, or dissolve, as I claim, according to deep ecologists, into rainforests, ecosystems, mountains, rivers, and so on, these phenomena must share in the intellectuality, imagination, foresight, communicative abilities and empathy that human beings possess, that is, if biocentric equality is to have any meaning. On the other hand, we may decide to agree with Robin Eckersley, a champion of biocentrism, that no such abilities are necessary that the navigational skills of birds are themselves on a par with the wide-ranging intelligence of people. Quote. Is there not something self-serving and arrogant in the, unverifiable, claim that first nature is striving to achieve something that has presently reached its most developed form in us, second nature? A more impartial, biocentric approach would be simply to acknowledge that our special capabilities, e.g. a highly developed consciousness, language, and tool-making capability, are simply one form of excellence alongside the myriad others, e.g. the navigational skills of birds, the sonar capability and playfulness of dolphins, and the intense sociality of ants, rather than the form of excellence thrown up by evolution. End quote. Note. Robin Eckersley, Divining Evolution, The Ecological Ethics of Murray Book Chin, Environmental Ethics, Volume 11, Summer 1989, p. 115. End note. Whether birds have navigation skills, which assumes conscious agency in negotiating their migratory flights over vast distance with clear geographical goals, or primarily tropistic reactions to changes in daylight and possibly the Earth's magnetic fields of force, need not occupy us here. What counts is that Eckersley's state of mind, like that of deep ecologists generally essentially debases the intellectual powers of people who, over previous centuries, consciously mapped the globe, gave it mathematical coordinates, and invented magnetic compasses, chronometers, radar, and other tools for navigation. They did so with an intellectuality, flexibility, and with techniques that no bird can emulate, that is, with amazing skillfulness, since skill involves more than physical reactions to natural forces and stimuli. When Eckersley places the largely tropistic reactions of birds on a par with human thought, she diminishes the human mind and its extraordinary abilities. One might as well say that plants have skills that are on a par with human intellectuality because plants can engage in photosynthesis, a complex series of biochemical reactions to sunlight. 
are such reactions really commensurate with the ability of physicists to understand how solar fusion occurs and of biochemists to understand how photosynthesis occurs? If so, then corals invented techniques for producing islands and plants invented techniques for reaching to the sun in heavily forested areas. In short, placing human intellectual foresight, logical processes, and innovations on a PAR with tropistic reactions to external stimuli is to create a stupendous intellectual muddle, not to evoke the deep insights that deep ecologists claim to bring to our understanding of humanity's interaction with the natural world. Eckersley's crude level of argumentation is no accident, Deval and Sessions prepare us for it by approvingly citing Warwick Fox to the effect that we can make no firm ontological divide in the field of existence, that there is no bifurcation in reality between the human and the non-human realms to the extent that we perceive boundaries, we fall short of deep ecological consciousness. Note. Deval and Sessions, Deep Ecology P66. Actually, this quotation from Fox comes from a criticism of Deep Ecology in the Ecologist, Volume 14, Number 5 to 6, 1984, pages 194 to 200 and 201 to 4, which does not prevent Deval and Sessions from bringing it to the service of Deep Ecology. End note. No one has quite told Wales, I assume, about this new evolutionary dispensation. Still less are grizzly bears, wolves, entire rainforest ecosystems, mountains, rivers, and so on aware of their community with human beings. Indeed, in this vast panoply of life forms, ecosystems, mineral matter, and so on, no creature seems to be capable of knowing, irrespective of how they communicate with members of their own kind, about the existence or absence of this firm ontological divide except human beings. If as Deval and Sessions seem to believe, there is no firm ontological divide between the human and non-human realms, it is unknown to every species in the biosphere, let alone entities in the abiotic world, except our own. In fact, the ontological divide between the non-human and the human is very real. Human beings, to be sure, are primates, mammals, and vertebrates. They cannot, as yet, get out of their animal skins. As products of organic evolution, they are subject to the natural vicissitudes that bring enjoyment, pain, and death to complex life forms generally. But it is a crucial fact that they alone know, indeed, can know that there is a phenomenon called evolution, they alone know that death is a reality, they alone can even formulate such notions as self-realization, biocentric equality and a self in self, they alone can generalize about their existence, past, present, and future, and produce complex technologies, create cities, communicate in a complex syllabic form, and so on. To call these stupendous attributes and achievements mere differences in degree between human beings and non-human life forms, and to equate human consciousness with the navigational skills of migratory birds, is so preposterously naive that one might expect such absurdities from children, not professors. What apparently worries deep ecologists about this divide, with all its bifurcations and boundaries, is not so much that its existence is obvious as that it is inconvenient. Beclouding their simplistic monism, we may suppose is a fear of the dualism of René Descartes, which they feel obliged to dispel. Ironically they seem incapable of coping with this dualism without taking recourse to a Bambi-style anthropomorphism that effectively transforms all non-human beings into precisely what they profess to abhor, namely, anthropomorphisms. If they cannot make human beings into non-human animals, they make non-human animals into human beings. Accordingly animals are said to have skills in much the same sense that human beings do. The earth has its own wisdom, wilderness is equated with freedom, and all life forms exhibit moral qualities that are entirely the product of human intellectual, emotional, and social development. Put bluntly, if human beings are equal in intrinsic worth to non-human beings, then boundaries between human and non-human are erased, and either human beings are merely one of a variety of animals, or else non-human beings are human. But then, why should they not be in the Disneyland world of deep ecology? 
Having entangled the reader with extravagant claims for a set of unsupported personal beliefs, Deval and Sessions proceed in the name of an exclusively human act of deep questioning and meditative process to reduce readers to the status of plain citizens of the biotic community not lord or master over all other species. Note. Ebedem, p. 68 and note. Deval and Sessions use words with multiple meanings to give the most alienating interpretation to people. Whatever a democracy could possibly mean in the animal world, human beings are not mere plain citizens in a biospheric democracy. They are immensely superior to any other animal species, although deep ecologists equate superiority with being the lord and master of all other species, hence an authoritarian concept. But superior may mean not only higher in rank, status, and authority but of great value, excellence, extraordinary, if my dictionary is correct. That superiority can simply mean having more knowledge, foresight, and wisdom, attributes we might expect to find in a teacher or even a Zen master, seems to disappear from the highly selective deep ecological lexicon. Deep ecology's contradictory presuppositions, intuitions, anthropomorphisms, and naive assertions leave us spinning like tops. We are enjoined to engage in deep questioning in order to decide on intuitive grounds that we are intrinsically no different in worth or value from any entity in the ecosphere. Yet the deep questioning so prized by Deval, Sessions, Ness, Etal, is something that no other life form can do, besides us. In the vastness of the ecosphere, nothing apart from human beings is capable of even voicing the notion of biocentric egalitarianism much less understanding any notion of rights, intrinsic worth, or superiority and inferiority. It is the ultimate in anthropomorphism to impute a moral sense to animals that lack the conceptual material of abstract thought provided by language and the rich generalizations we form in our minds from our vast repertoire of words. Strictly speaking, if we were nothing but plain citizens in the ecosphere, we should be as furiously anthropocentric in our behavior, just as a bear is ursocentric or a wolf kinocentric. That is to say as plain citizens of the ecosphere, and nothing more, we should, like every other animal, be occupied exclusively with our own survival, comfort, and safety. As Richard Watson has so astutely noted, if we are to treat man as part of nature on egalitarian terms with other species, then man's behavior must be treated as morally neutral true, that is, as amoral. In which case Watson continues, we should not think there is something morally or ecosophically wrong with the human species dispossessing and causing the extinction of other species. Note. Richard Watson, Ecoethics, Challenging the Underlying Dogmas of Environmentalism, Whole Earth Review, March 1985, pages 5 to 13. End note. Yet deep ecologists ask us precisely in the name of a biospheric citizenship not to be occupied exclusively with our survival. Put simply, deep ecologists ask us to be plain citizens and at the same time expect, even oblige, us to think and behave as very uncommon, indeed quite extraordinary ones. In a perceptive article critic Harold Fromm states this contradiction with remarkable pithiness, quote, The intrinsic worth that biocentrists connect with animals, plants, and minerals is projected by the desiring human psyche in the same way that the will of God is projected by human vanity upon a silent universe that never says anything. The biocentric notion of intrinsic worth is even more narcissistically anthropocentric than ordinary self-interest because it hopes to achieve its ends by denying that oneself is the puppeteer ventriloquist behind the world one perceives as valuable. End quote. Note. Harold from Ecology and Ideology, Hudson Review, Spring 1992, p. 30 End Note As biocentrists, deep ecologists ask us take the role of the invisible puppeteer, pulling the strings and ignoring the fact that we are pulling them. If human beings are to regard themselves merely as plain citizens or equals to all other species in the biosphere, they must be invisible puppeteers, they must be guided by ethical canons that exist nowhere in the animal world and, at the same time, deny that they differ in their rights and intrinsic worth from the amoral world of nature, in short, bereft of ethics. Indeed, 
deep ecologists urge us to do this because we will aesthetically materially and spiritually benefit from holding such an attitude toward the natural world, a crassly anthropocentric argument. That only human beings in the entire biosphere can confer rights upon non-human beings precisely because as humans they are so radically different from other life forms seems to elude most deep ecologists. Where deep ecologists try to resolve this conundrum, their solutions are sophistic at best and circular at worst. Employing ethics and values, which are cultural objects, observes Christopher Maynes, one of the most misanthropic of the deep ecologists may appear to contradict the content of biocentrism, and it is undoubtedly incongruous to talk about the rights of nature when the concept of legal rights is traditionally associated with the triumph of culture over nature, or, in Kantian terms, duty over instinct. Note. Christopher Maynes, Green Rage, Radical Environmentalism and the Unmaking of Civilization, Boston, Little, Brown and Co., 1990, pages 147 to 8. End note. Despite the pejorative characterization of rights as the triumph of culture over nature, legal rights are not necessarily or often commonly equatable with ethics and values, which may often stand in flat opposition to a culture's laws. In the absence of human beings, moreover, nature cannot of itself generate any system of rights, which still leaves us in a puzzle. To resolve it, Maynes invokes Ness's point that our self includes not only our ego and our social self, on which the imperatives of ethics play, but also a broader identification with ecology itself. Speaking bluntly, this is pure rhetoric, not a deep reply. Indeed, broadening our ego and our social self does not necessarily bring about a broader identification with ecology, that is with other life forms, mountains, rivers, and so on. There are many examples of selfhood in which the self is formed in contrast to other human selves, not necessarily in contrast to an encompassing natural world. In another ideological strategy Maynes asserts that in the concept of the ecological self, human interests and natural interests become fused and there is no need to appeal to the traditional discourse of rights and values. The integrity of the biosphere is seen as the integrity of our own persons, the rights of the natural world are implied in our right to be human and humane. Note. Ebedum, p. 148, emphasis added. End note. This amounts to a white flag of surrender. What interests can be imputed to nature that are even definable in ethical terms? How do they become fused with the interests of humans, those plain citizens whose intrinsic worth is equal to that of all other life forms? What constitutes the integrity of the biosphere? Why are the rights of the natural world implied in our right to be human and humane? Where did ideas of interests and integrity come from, if not from human morality and an anthropomorphic conceptualization of human interests? To mechanically transfer the complex repertoire of rights, moral strictures, wisdom, and philosophy that exists in society to the biosphere, as though this repertoire could arise let alone exist, without human beings is to grossly mystify humanity's interaction with the natural world and neutralize the rich content of these distinctly humanistic terms. Divested of their historical, social, and cultural moorings, these social ideas and practices are cheapened into slogans. This divestiture renders it impossible to formulate a serious ethics that can be used in humanity's relations with the natural world, as well as between human and human in the social world reduced to abstractions that float in an intuitional cloud, values, rights, and humane behavior, are more transcendental than real, in a de facto dualism that simply bypasses their human origins, and actually becomes captive to the very origins it seeks to avoid. As Maynes writes, invoking Warwick Fox, the real goal of this ecological ethics is the decentering of humankind, as though it were not human beings alone and only alone who could follow ethical injunctions in relation to the natural world. Note. Ebedum, p. 147. End note. While deep ecology trivializes the human spirit, it depends immensely on humanistic appeals to support its most basic tenets. Moreover, its absorption of human individuality into a mystical self in self of cosmic proportions advances a reactionary message. 
in a mass society where selfhood is atrophying under the assault of social forces and institutions over which the individual has virtually no control, when disempowerment has become an epical social pathology, when women, people of color, the poor, and the underprivileged are asked to surrender what fragments of autonomy and freedom they still possess to the power of multinational corporations, impersonal bureaucracies, and the state, the decentering of humankind opens the way for a cultural and social barbarism of frightening proportions. Equally troubling is the outright misanthropy that many deep ecologists advance. To Christopher Manes, for example humanity is a relatively expendable part of the environment. Note. Ebedum, P71, emphasis in the original. End note. Such derogatory views of humanity are matched by the icy indifference to human life and suffering in the writing of deep ecology's most important theorists. Consider the following dilemma, an active rattlesnake takes up residence under a family house posing a grave danger to the child who lives there. The father must decide whether to kill the snake or risk the death of his child. For most people this would not be a difficult decision, but for deep ecologists, the vital needs of the child and the snake, for life, are equal. Bill Deval, who actually cites such a case in his book, Simple in Means, Rich in Ends, 1990, advances a principle of species impartiality by which such decisions can be made. Deval's principle reads, Fairness in resolution of real conflicts can only occur when humans are not given any special privileges because they are humans. By this principle that is, humans should allow themselves no special privileges in coping with such problems merely because they are humans. Note. Bill Deval, Simple in Means, Rich in Ends, Practicing Deep Ecology, Salt Lake City, Peregrine Smith Books, 1990, p. 176 End Note. The child's father, who has already survived several bites from rattlesnakes, opts for killing the snake, earning Deval's reproval, I urged the father to make peace with the rattlesnake the way St. Francis made peace between a wolf and villagers in northern Italy in the famous 13th century story. Note. Ebedum, p. 177. End Note. Alas, we are not all saints like Francis with a special pipeline to God. Lest we suspect that Deval is merely fatuous, errant misanthropy emerges in the closing pages of his book, we lack compassion and seem, misanthropic if we turn our backs on hundreds of millions of humans who reside in megalopolises. However, when a choice must be made, it seems consistent with deep ecology principles to fight on the side of endangered species and animals, and presumably ignore the plight of congested urban dwellers, which is a concern of misplaced humanists. Note. Ebedum, p. 189. End note. What concerns Deval about cities is not only the absence of wild animals, there but the extent to which urban elites exercise power with their materialist ideology and nihilism. This trend, too, is a concern only of misplaced humanists, who also would wrong-headedly, in Deval's view, justify large-scale in-migration to Western Europe and North America from Latin America and Africa. Note. Ebedum, p. 189. End note. Such views are redolent of the reactionary ideology currently abounding in the first world against people of color from the third world. Finally deep ecology is heir to the lingering legacy of Malthus, whose warning about population growth outstripping food production was ignored by the rising tide of industrial-slash-technological optimism, according to Deval and Sessions. Note. Sessions and Deval, Deep Ecology P46. End note. Whereupon they extol William Catton, Jr., author of Overshoot, for applying the ecological concept of carrying capacity and remind us that William Voigt, who articulated the environmental crisis, anticipated the work of radical ecologist Paul Ehrlich in the 1960s. Votes recipes for diminishing population by withholding antibiotics from third world countries go unmentioned. See Chapter 3. Note. Ebedum End Note. The misanthropic orientation of deep ecology was taken to its logical conclusion by Earth First's founding thinkers who, 
unencumbered by academic peer pressures, were more outspoken than Ness, Deval, and Sessions. An inglorious moment of truth occurred in an interview with David Foreman, Earth First's indubitable leader, conducted by Bill Deval and published in an Australian periodical, Simply Living, in 1986. Note. Bill Deval, a spanner in the woods, interview with David Foreman, in Simply Living, Vol 2, No. 12, C 1986-87, pages 3-4. Simply Living is published in Australia. End note. Deval's introduction to the interview was inimitable in its admiration of Foreman. One of Foreman's quotes, Deval exudes, is from John Muir concerning the relations between bears and people. Muir wrote, over a hundred years ago, that if a war should come between bears and humans, he would be sorely tempted to fight on the side of bears. Says Foreman, that day has arrived, and I am enlisting in service to the bears. Deval first asked Foreman, what is the relation between deep ecology and earth first? To which Foreman replied, I think deep ecology is the philosophy of earth first they are pretty much the same thing but I think earth first is a particular style of deep ecology. The moment of truth, however, followed Deval's pointed question, do you think population is an important issue? To which Foreman responded, quote, when I tell people how the worst thing we could do in Ethiopia is to give aid, the best thing would be to just let nature seek its own balance, to let the people there just starve there, they think that is monstrous. But the alternative is that you go in and save these half-dead children who will never live a whole life. Their development will be stunted. And what's going to happen in ten years' time is that twice as many people will suffer and die. End quote. These charitable remarks were followed by an opinion on immigration by Latin Americans to the United States. Letting the USA be an overflow valve for problems in Latin America is not solving a thing. It's just putting more pressure on the resources we have in the USA. It is just causing more destruction of our wilderness, more poisoning of water and air, and it isn't helping the problems in Latin America. Deval a pillar in the triune propagators of deep ecology in the United States, found nothing to object to in these statements, indeed, he seemed to acknowledge the legitimacy of Foreman's concern by offering the helpful query, why haven't mainstream environmental groups dealt with the population issue? Foreman's mentor, Edward Abbey, intruded ethnic chauvinism, indeed, elements of nativism, into the debate that followed this interview. Abbey wrote, quote, there are a good many reasons to call a halt to further immigration into the United States. One seldom mentioned, however, is culture, the United States that we live in today with its traditions and ideals, however imperfectly realized, is a product of Northern European civilization. If we allow our country, our country, to become Latinized we will be forced to accept a more rigid class system, a patron style of politics and a greater reliance on crime and violence as normal instruments of social change. End quote. Note. Edward Abbey, Letter to the Editor, Bloomsbury Review, April May 1986, p4. End note. Elsewhere he repeated this theme, quote. Perhaps ever continuing industrial and population growth is not the true road to human happiness in which case it might be wise for us as American citizens to consider calling a halt to the mass influx of ever more millions of hungry ignorant, unskilled, and culturally morally genetically impoverished people. End quote. Note. Edward Abbey, Immigration and Liberal Taboos, In One Life at a Time, Please, New York, Henry Holt & Co., 1988, p. 43. End note. Genetically Impoverished, no less. One is prone to cry, really. In fact, an article I wrote in response to these remarks and the Foreman Deval interview, Social Ecology vs. Deep Ecology, a challenge for the ecology movement, was greeted with savage acrimony, sprinkled with a measure of red baiting, over several issues of Earth First. Note. Murray Bookchin, Social Ecology vs. Deep Ecology, Green Perspectives, Number 4-5, September 1987. 
Earth First, 1 November 1987, pages 17 to 22. For an exchange between myself and Edward Abbey, see Utney Reader, January February 1988, pages 4 to 8, and March April 1988, p. 7. End note. To this day, I can only wonder if academic deep ecologists would ever have dissociated themselves from the misanthropic and nativistic views Foreman expressed in the Simply Living interview had I not criticized it. Note. George Bradford was another early critic of Foreman's interview, in How Deep is Deep Ecology, initially published in Fifth Estate, Fall 1987, and republished under the same title as a pamphlet, Ohio CA, Times Change Press, 1989, p. 49. But Bradford was by no means unsympathetic to deep ecology's wilderness cult. More opposed to technological innovations than even most deep ecology theorists, he wrote, deep ecology loves all that is wild and free, so I share an affinity with deep ecologists that has made this essay difficult to write. End note. Even after my intervention, it took a year, to the best of my knowledge, before Arne Ness, Bill Deval, George Sessions, and Warwick Fox renounced Foreman's position with varying degrees of emphasis. Note. See Bill Deval, Deep Ecology and its Critics, George Sessions, Ecocentrism and the Greens, Deep Ecology and the Environmental Task, and Arne Ness, a European looks at the North American branch of the Deep Ecology movement, all in Trumpeter, Volume 5, Number 2, Spring 1988. See also Warwick Fox, The Deep Ecology Ecofeminism Debate and Its Parallels, Environmental Ethics, Volume 11, Spring 1989, pages 20 to 1, note 38. End note. Still later, Foreman in a debate with me seemed to withdraw his harsher misanthropic formulations. For some two years, the environmental press resounded with the criticism and counter-criticisms between supporters of Foreman's simply living views and my own, nor have they entirely quieted down to this day. Note. My debate with Foreman was published in book form, entitled Defending the Earth, Boston, South End Press, 1990. End note. Sessions' dissociation from Foreman's views, in fact, proved to be equivocal. Writing in Foreman's new magazine, Wild Earth, in 1992, Sessions declared, in 1987, Murray Bookchin and his social ecology group attacked Earth first. And the deep ecology philosophy. Certain casual remarks by individual Earth firsters, made, to some extent for their shock value to drive home the message of how out of balance contemporary humans are on the planet, concerning allowing Ethiopians to starve, and AIDS as nature's population control device, provided Bookchin with the opportunity he needed. Note. George Sessions, Radical Environmentalism in the 90s, Wild Earth, Fall 1992, p. 66, emphasis added. End note. Sessions' expression of solidarity with Foreman's behavior, which he had previously renounced, hardly merits comment. At the time the Simply Living interview was published, to the best of my knowledge, neither Foreman, Deval, or other luminaries in the deep ecology movement characterized Foreman's observations as casual, still less delivered simply for their shock value. Quite to the contrary Foreman and many of his supporters defended these remarks militantly. Deep ecology and much of its literature is unervingly redolent of the reactionary views chronicled by Fritz Stern and George Moss in Germany prior to the rise of National Socialism. Note. See Fritz Stern, The Politics of Cultural Despair, A Study in the Rise of the Germanic Ideology, Berkeley and Los Angeles, University of California Press, 1961, and George L. Moss, The Crisis of German Ideology, Intellectual Origins of the Third Reich, New York, Grosset and Dunlap, 1964. End note. Cries like Back to the Pleistocene, during Earth First's militant days contribute to a mentality that denies human uniqueness even as it appeals to human beings to carry out an ethics that no animal can possibly have. At the same time, deep ecology views humanity rather cheaply. 
its literature abounds with denunciations of humanity as a cancer on the planet and human intervention into the natural world as demonic. Hardly any connection is shown between the social maladies that afflict our age and their role in determining society's relationship to the natural world. It holds the basic assumption of Lynn White, Jr., that our present environmental problems stem from cultural origins, that is, Christianity's disdain for the natural world. Note. Lynn White, Jr., The Historic Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, Science, Volume 155, 10 March, 1967, pages 1203 to 7. End note. This argument reduces society's relationship to the natural world to simplistic psychological terms. If we merely remedy our thinking and living habits, individual by individual, we shall presumably become plain citizens of the biosphere with agreeable ecological habits. The impact of this personalistic view of the ecological crisis and its sources, has, like sociobiology and ecomysticism, significantly shifted public attention from the social roots of our ecological dislocations to a psychological level of discussion, if not a religious view. Arne Ness, perhaps the most socially concerned of the deep ecologists, merely collapses into extreme inconsistencies when he deals with his social ideas. In his Ecology Community and Lifestyle, Outline of an Ecosophy, Nee severs that deep ecologists seem to move more in the direction of nonviolent anarchism than towards communism. Contemporary nonviolent anarchists are clearly close to the green direction of the political triangle. Whereupon Nice quickly catapults from his seemingly gentle anarchism into claims that with the enormous and exponentially increasing human population pressure and war or warlike conditions in many places, it seems inevitable to maintain some fairly strong central political institutions. Note. Arne Ness, Ecology Community and Lifestyle, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 1989, p. 157, emphasis added. End note. Indeed, lest this not seem demanding enough, he adds that the higher the level of local self-determination the stronger the central authority must be in order to override local sabotage of fundamental green policies. Aside from the element of new speak here, in which the higher the level of local self-determination, the greater is our need for a central authority, such calls for a strong central authority let it be noted, have become the bedrock credo of extreme right-wing environmentalists in Europe. Note. Ness, Ecology Community P157, Emphasis Added. End note. In the light of Ness's commitment to a strong state, what happens to free choice, idiosyncratic behavior, personal talents, and individuality? Or, for that matter, to his nonviolent anarchism? And, if the cosmic self into which the self should dissolve is a superhuman organism, a whole, a totality, that blots out personal identity in traditional families and communities structured around castes, Deep ecology can easily become an ideology for a strong centralized state in the name of perpetuating the rights of nature. Ecomysticism is part of a larger spectrum of mysticism that plagues the Anglo-American and German consciousness on a scale that seems very much like a throwback to medievalism. It is smug, indeed, to express worried concern about the rise of Islamic and Christian fundamentalism while ignoring phenomena like channeling, astrology feng shui, tarot, Jungian archetypal psychology, infantilism, and angelology, to cite some of the more prominent ideologies on the ever-widening landscape of spiritualism and mysticism. Despite two centuries of enlightened humanism and rationalism, the past few decades have seen an appalling regression by a sizable part of the public into supernatural and supernatural cults. More than 90% of Americans, for example believe in the existence of a supernatural deity. A comparable number believe in the immortality of their souls, and a few individuals have tested this conviction with near-death experiences, in an effluvium of recent books. 67% of the American public claims to have experienced extrasensory perception, ESP, 42% allow that they have had, or have, contact with the dead, 31% claim to possess clairvoyant powers, and 29% have had visions of one kind or another. 
Andrew Greeley who conducted this survey with the University of Chicago's National Opinion Research Council in the late 1980s, observes, our studies show that people who've tasted the paranormal, whether they accept it intellectually or not, are anything but religious nuts or psychiatric cases. They are, for the most part, ordinary Americans, somewhat above the norm in education and intelligence and somewhat less than average in religious involvement. Note. Andrew Greeley Mysticism Goes Mainstream, American Health, January-February 1987, pages 47-9. End note. Nor should Europeans be consoled that this problem is strictly American, the scale in Western Europe may not be as great as in the United States, but there is prima facie evidence of mysticism's rapid growth on the continent. Indeed, at a time when Nobel laureates in physics and other leading figures in high culture argue quite seriously about the existence of deities and spirits, we have reason to shudder about what is going on among the less educated, ordinary people surveyed by Greeley and his associates. Seekers in the realm of the paranormal who undertake a survey of the cults themselves are likely to suffer few disappointments about their grip on the public mind. A veritable jungle of paranormal cults and nostrums abounds in the United States broadcast airwaves are filled with fundamentalist preachers, of often dubious theological credentials and even more dubious morals, the advertisements of psychics and astrologists, many of whom profess to possess a license to engage in their crafts by professional societies, are everywhere. These televisionists are prepared to offer their insights on life and destiny over the telephone for a suitable charge, characteristically at $3.95 a minute, a bargain compared with a $4 charge. Such sums are likely to chill the ardor of the most parsimonious mystics, who have to make do with the advice and predictions they glean from the astrology columns of the daily newspaper or from periodicals with names like miracles. The airwaves are cluttered with the shrieks of strident opinion makers who variously bark their views on God and interview people who claim to have communicated with extraterrestrials. Tabloid newspapers in supermarkets celebrate everything from the revival of Egyptian mummies to parents whose youngest child is half fish and half human. To be sure, mystical cults are as much a part of Euro-American life as apple pie in the United States, fish and chips in Britain, knockwurst in Germany, or perhaps McDonald's hamburgers everywhere. We need not look to ancient Rome, the medieval world, or the Reformation to find evidence of how readily cults have turned into sedate, even universalist religions or demonologies. The explosive growth of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, beyond its home terrain in Utah to all parts of the United States and to numerous countries abroad attests to the growing gullibility of people who live in an era that has actually unearthed the secrets of life and matter. The influence of Mary Eddy Baker's Gospel of Christian Science, with its rejection of modern medicine in favor of the therapeutic powers of biblical precept, by far exceeds the influence of Mark Twain's scathing books on Mormonism and Christian Science alike. Yet Christian science has been only a century or so in the making, while Mormonism began to surface on a worldwide scale only in the past two generations. What makes the present-day cults a unique phenomenon is that they are appearing at a time when there is no lack of secular knowledge, such as characterized past ages, but rather when there is a surfeit of such knowledge. Mystical and particularly anti-rational and anti-humanistic cults are becoming prevalent because more and more people know too much, even if vaguely, about the nature of reality, and they are frightened by what they know. Science and reason have told them that they are on their own, with enormous powers to change the world around them, for better or worse. Lest we exaggerate the impact of metaphysics and high culture, their problem is not that Hegel and Nietzsche have told them that God is dead, or that Max Weber has told them that the world is disenchanted, however much these notions have been played up by academics. Few of the modern cultists have ever read Nietzsche, still fewer Hegel, nor are they likely to be familiar with Weber. It is a vanity that academics entertain that their own interests correspond to those of the non-academic public. Moreover, as history has shown, people can behave quite frightfully or carry the burden of terrible afflictions, from famine to war, on their shoulders in the full belief that God is alive and the world is enchanted. 
Far more important than the archaic beliefs they hold or have discarded are the contradictions in the human condition itself. The enormous promise of technology to provide a world of material abundance, security, and freedom from toil has not been fulfilled for most of humanity and it is largely the mystification of social reality not the power of ideological hyperreality, that has produced a desire to escape from the existing state of affairs. Put simply, modern people adhere to traditional beliefs with the same devotion that filled the hearts of their ancestors of earlier times. The enormous revival of religion in Russia, following the breakdown of a militantly atheistic communist state, together with the growth of a bourgeois mean-spiritedness and anti-Semitism after two generations of socialist re-education between 1917 and the 1980s, attests to the tenuous hold of belief systems when they are merely systems of belief. A good deal more than beliefs account for human behavior, even for the beliefs people profess to hold. For most people what truly counts is whether their beliefs are consistent with the reality around them. If they are not, people may shift their beliefs, adopting either an enlightened humanism that explains reality, or superstitions that allow them to escape from reality. In our own time, belief systems are particularly tenuous because the social world is changing too rapidly to support any ideology for a great length of time. An ideology that seems acceptable today quickly becomes obsolete tomorrow, even before it can be elaborated and become deeply entrenched in the popular mind. The consequence of these rapid social transformations is that we live in a world of cults rather than entrenched traditional ideologies, of lightly held myths rather than seriously considered convictions, and, above all, of easily adopted absurdities that are only half-believed and discarded as easily as garments. Psychic instability reflects, in great measure, modern-day social and technological instability. The sillier a given craze, the more likely it is that it will be adopted as an ideological plaything and then let go as a passing absurdity. Its future depends upon whether it provides people with respite from the demands of a changing world that is very much in need of rational control and whose management seems to be clouded in mystery. Thus present-day cults, from ecomysticism to various theisms, reenchant nothing, despite their extravagant claims to do so. In a broad sense, they are merely means to avoid an extravagantly mobile reality that must sooner or later be engaged by using candor and secular understanding, if its potentialities for a rational way of life are not to be aborted be it by an ecological, social, or military disaster. The process of psychologically eluding reality has been very much underway since the early 1970s. Its roots can be found in the 1960s counterculture, which, once it lost its political direction, rapidly disintegrated into privatism, an ever-changing collection of nostrums for personal development, and a mysticism inherited from the beatniks. An omnibook of personal development, published in 1977 with the imprimatur of psychology today lists more than a hundred strategies for variously finding, sedating, and slash or improving oneself. Note. Katinka Matson, The Psychology Today Omnibook of Personal Development, New York, William Morrow & Co., 1977. End note. Some of these strategies have gone out of fashion, after only a fairly short lifespan, Others persist marginally, almost by sheer psychic and social inertia, quite a few are now established techniques, and still others are quasi-religious and religious belief systems in their entirety. Their greatest merit, in most cases, is that they are usable, practical, and possibly interchangeable, each adding synergistically to the other for enhanced re-enchantment or therapy. Acupuncture, of course enjoys the prestige of antiquity. Just as the ancient Greeks thought Egypt was the font of wisdom because of its long history, so acupuncture, to which we can also add shamanism, tantra, and yoga, shares the pedigree of ancient oriental origins. But much of the omnibook is filled with techniques and belief systems popular in the 1970s whose heyday has long since passed, supplanted by what I can best call old new mysticisms and theisms, the recycled products of traditional, even long discarded, beliefs leveraged into usage for the end of the century and the beginning of the new one. They are marked by juvenility, by a steady retreat into a world of fairy tales and childhood phases of life. 
they are the stuff of primality close to critical examination and intellectual growth, with all its phases, pains, and demands. An exemplary primal fad is the pursuit of the inner child, a psychomystique that was born decades ago when a cult shaped by the notion of a fall from innocence in private life focused on an inner nature of the individual that adulthood had tainted with experience, rationality, and responsibility. Synergized by neo-Freudian notions of infantile polymorphousness, Jungian archetypes, and the like, it can even be traced back to a Christian precept, which gives childhood innocence and sheep-like meekness a high degree of valuation over maturity and its overly civilized doubts about the world. Like the new popularity of The Simpsons, a television cartoon series for adult audiences, the new infantilism seems to appeal to a still-surviving sucking instinct in the psyche that is beyond the constraints of age and experience. As Newsweek reports, with grown baby boomers acting like perpetual teens, real teens are acting like infants. At a juice bar in a fashionable New York dance club, a man wears a pajamas top and a Donald Duck backpack, while in a corner, Dr. Seuss-style stocking caps flop madly. Nearly everyone at the dance hall is adorned with pacifiers, kitty charms, doll-like figurines, and playing with toys. A sturdy construction worker in his early twenties declares, we've got to be tots again. That life was so cool. You just sucked. Note. Ned Zeman, who let the inner child out. Newsweek, December 28, 1992, p. 67 End note. Infantilism persists in modish stores that sell toys and games expressly designed for adults of all ages. Not only juvenile amulets but giant panda bears are available to any middle-class man or woman who may want to cuddle up with ersatz furry things in the journey to sleepland. Tapes can be bought that bring on a gradual dozing, if not nostalgia, with songs like London Bridge is Falling Down, Batman, and The Flintstones, movies based on cartoons popular when the baby boomers were children, draw record adult audiences today. If these juvenilisms do not improve our knowledge of the world, people who say they have had near-death experiences assure us all will end well in the next one. Everyone, it seems, will be well received in heaven. An increasing number of articles, books, and radio and television interviews describe the contours of the afterlife. For those who doubt the immortality of the soul, most near-death experiences describe a glowing light after life has temporarily ended that is iridescently inviting, which should cause us to wonder, given the sales figures these books rack up, why the reader desires to remain in this earthly veil of tears at all. Ecomysticism may be for highbrows, but angelology is for everyone. This latest extension of biblical theology into modern yuppie and plebeian culture alike has a number of clergymen worried, for if we all have angels with whom we may directly communicate, what need have we for clerics? In any case the growing public fascination with the angels among us, to cite the title of a feature article by several writers in Time magazine, may be taken as an example of how the modern mystical zeitgeist relies on materiality and tangibility, not merely on the invisible and metaphysical. Note. Sam Ellis Etal, The Angels Among Us, Time, December 27, 1993, pages 56 to 5. End note. Clerical trepidations aside, such prestigious institutions as Harvard Divinity School and Boston College, among others, offer courses on angels, and the potentiality for a growing audience of believers should not be sneezed at. A recent Time-slash-CNN telephone survey reports that nearly 70% of the American public believe that angels exist. 55% believe that they are higher spiritual beings created by the deity who has empowered them to act as his agents on earth. Another 15%er believe that they are the spirits of people who died. Only 7% believe that angels are a figment of the imagination, while 18% regard them as symbolically important. Inasmuch as angels are annoyingly invisible certain techniques are obviously important to force them to materialize. A veritable industry has grown up to give angels tangibility. A recent article in Time read, quote, In their modern incarnation, these mighty messengers angels have been reduced to bite-sized beings, easily digested. 
the terrifying cherubim have become cupidal cherubs. For those who choke too easily on God and his rules, theologians observe, angels are the handy compromise all fluff and meringue, kind, non-judgmental. And they are available to everyone, like aspirin. Each of us has a guardian angel, declares Eileen Feeman, who publishes a newsletter Angel Watch from her home in Mountainside, New Jersey. They are non-threatening, wise, and living beings. They offer help whether we ask for it or not. But mostly we ignore them. End quote. If we do, we are ungenerous, and the closing years of the 20th century suggest that we may soon be giving them more attention than our medieval ancestors in the 13th century gave them. Authors seriously speculate about their form and fallibility, the reasons that they intrigue us, the nature of angel encounters, and their functions. Theologians are now beginning to complain that the trivialization of angelology has reached a point where popular authors who render angels into household pets, who invite readers to get in touch with their inner angel, or summon their own angel psychotherapist or view themselves as angels in training, write the time reporters on the subject, are trafficking in discount spirituality. Initiates to this fascinating field may acquire a practical guide to working with the messengers of heaven to empower and enrich their lives by consulting Ask Your Angels. To gain so commanding a power for only $10 is a literary bargain by any current standard. Note. Alma Daniel, Timothy Wiley, and Andrew Romer, Ask Your Angels, New York, Ballantine Books, 1992. End note. Indeed, as the book cover advertises, if you've picked up this book, the angels have already touched you, which may well obviate your need to buy it. But should you do so, you will find within a winsome, fair, light brown female angel, with flowery wings sprouting from her shoulder blades. The sketches inside the book show angels blowing trumpets, whether to attune themselves to the music of the spheres or avoid oncoming traffic is not clear. Most of the book is loaded with practical details on how to ask your angels or, more inspirationally, the grace process, which subdivides into grounding, releasing, aligning, conversing, and enjoying. You can learn how to work in partnership with the angels by fine-tuning the angelic connection, writing letters and dreaming with the angels, working with the angels to advance your goals, working with the angels in recovery and healing, and if all the bases aren't covered, working with the angels in all your relationships. Indeed, lest your burdens be too heavy for one angel to handle, the book closes with a chapter titled Working with the Angels in Groups. It will help, the writers advise to use a tape recorder so you can listen to the way you address angels, thus does the technological age intrude upon the divine and its blessings. This kind of mentality falls within the province of sympathetic magic, an outlook that Sir James Frazier's The Golden Bough explains and illustrates in considerable detail. Its primitive ancestry is fairly assured, angels were variously deities and, earlier, spirits that people created out of their own fertile imaginations with the aid of shamans and later of priests. If Christianity ranks people just below angels, they are, in all truth, below nothing, and if re-enchanting the world or rendering it sacred means looking up to nothing and populating it with figments of its own imagination, enlightened humanism demands that humanity look to reality and try to understand its own place in the world.